Section 16 of The Mystery of the Ocean Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Fraze. The Mystery of the Ocean Star by W. Clark Russell. Section 16 Seaside Effects. I am never weary of surveying the picture of the English Channel from the summit of the North Foreland. Not in the wildest weather, not even when the bitter January northeast gale flings something of the weight of the German Ocean into the stress of billows, do you ever witness a sea here comparable to what runs in small gales further south and west. The liquid tract is hedged about by shoals, and let the wind blow from what quarter it will, there is some bank of sand or four foot of chalk rock to break the fury of the surge. But on the other hand, here pass such processions of ships as must be sought for in vain in any other maritime highway. The charm of deep-sea fishing is, you never know what you are going to catch. So here, as you stand gazing oceanwards, hard by the white lighthouse, you never can guess what sort of picture will present itself next there is the true sea atmosphere here too the airy summer distant junction that makes a mirage of the far-off becalmed sail vague dimnesses of lingering smoke which give a sober colouring to the bold stare of the white cloud peering over the edge of some indefinable haze the hard sharpness of the green sea-line trembling against the cold grey the phantasmal swarming of shadows in the gathering glow of moonshine whose vibratory lines of icy radiance seem to be drawn like silver wire longer and longer yet by the countless busy fingers of the restless waters the blot or two of faintness star-like and elusive hanging in the far-off sky denoting the coast of france affects the eye as a fancy defines no limits but on the contrary fires the imagination with dreams of distance the frame is perfect let the month be what it will, and the canvas changes its beauties and its inspirations to every glance. There are many who abhor the sea. It is a waste without meaning or music. There are no syllables for their ears in the thunder of its surf, no thoughts too deep for tears to be got from the soft and melancholy singing of the foamless ripples, no glory in the meridian light standing like a pillar of fire in its deep heart, no grandeur in the greatness and the mystery of its dominions, no sovereignty in the storm demon's career on the roaring backs of their foaming coursers, no magic in the scarlet pavilions of the opening morn. Old ocean may break, break, break in vain for such honest folks. Sentiment cannot step one inch beyond the memory of the heaving steamboat, the pale-faced Frenchman, poor Smithers with his head in a tureen, and another half-hour yet before the pier shall show its nose. Perhaps if such people had even a little liking for the sea, she would use them better. After all, old ocean does not consist altogether of crossing between Calais and Dover and the Bay of Biscayo. There is a great deal more further on. You may begin with a little child standing on its knees in the summer surf, and not stop till the heart of the cyclone is entered. From the top of this white foreland height one gets as pretty a hint of that magnificent raree show as the heart could desire. The feeling is like that of standing in rotten row and seeing the people pass. It is a lovely girl, with the eyes of the south and the hair and skin of Thule. It is a gouty and groaning old man. It is a lordly creature, nobly horsed. It is a poor little scarecrow blundering along and getting home in the end. Ships are like human beings. I have said so again and again, and I believe it as ardently as if I were the first man to affirm it. Observe yonder yacht. It will not do to pretend that she does not know herself to be beautiful. She illustrates Pope's exquisite expression of the character of a fine lady. Favours to none, to all she smiles extends. Oft she rejects, but never once offends. Yes, the smile of sunlight on her bright and lovely canvas she extends to all, even to the poor little oyster-man dropping respectfully into her wake. But whom does she favour? She rejects the enamoured caress of the wave with a saucy smiting of her brows. But that she does not offend it you may tell by observing how the kiss is again and again attempted. She fits the scene like the gull that is flapping past her on a course as straight as a rook's the dye of its wings concealing them to the bare sight, and leaving nothing visible but the snow-white body that but for its constancy might pass for the melting head of a little sea. Now, overwhelming to the gaze of the radiant little sea coquette, 
there steamed solemnly past a huge white troopship her side perforated like a sieve with scuttles or portholes and her stern full of handsome windows her bulk makes her appear to move slowly yet she passes the yacht as fast as a man could walk what is her speed i assume her length to be so many feet and counting in seconds the time she occupies in passing a buoy that swirls to the tide in the grip of its ground tackle and leans southwardly i calculate her rate to be twelve and a quarter knots her tall white sides show up finely against the blue beyond there's a sort of sheen upon her that seems to overflow her outline like the pearly glimmer that white sails throw a little way beyond their own bolt ropes it has the effect of a thin radiant mist out of which when she starboards her helm for a more northerly course and brings the sunshine to bear upon her windows there leap double and triple rows of tongues of white fire one after another so like the flashings of a broadside that the ear is instinctively bent to catch the report an immense double-funnelled steamer outward bound comes along and when the two vessels are abreast i am surprised to notice that whilst the troop-ship is half as tall again as the other the ocean boat is nearly twice her length the red flag at the ensign staff is dipped and down very handsomely comes the red cross those men o' warsmen know how to handle bunting she keeps her hat off some minutes after the merchantman has mastheaded his colours why i cannot imagine until i spy a little brig hidden by her structure slide into view past her quarter with a little bit of red flag lowered so bowing to the salutations she receives as she goes the great white ship sparkling like some diamond encrusted hill thrusts majestically onwards with a curl of rich white under her brow and trailing a short smooth wake that shines like a rainbow under her counter to the lustre of her stern windows she and the fine new mail-boat dwarf all about them into insignificance they detain the eye and what will be picturesque when they are gone is now somewhat mean and squalid as they grow small and vague in the distance the charms of yonder old collier steal out every cloth is of different hue she is like an infirm old body who in an hour of bitter need has stripped a scarecrow and draped herself in garments designed to terrify birds she seems to hug her rags to her lean breast as she staggers onward with uncertain gait yet the spirit of the beauty of the deep possesses her the sunlight is upon her she hobbles against a background of clouds of cream and bronze the salt foam sings under her bends there is a distance too to soften her an old man in a tall hat the aged lady's husband no doubt stands at the tiller gazing sometimes aloft sometimes directing a glance over either quarter the breeze heads her the old boom foresail cannot do its work the tide does not serve her and the lightship a long way past her begins to slide ahead instead of astern of her down jib down stay foresail up mainsail and let go the anchor three or four heads bob along behind the rail a rusty piece of iron is let fall the cable is helped through the pipe and the lean weary and spiritless craft like to some beldam tottering off the dusty high road to rest her creaking limbs upon the grass nods peacefully upon the quiet waters and so shall go on slumbering till the wind comes fair again and starts the little crew upon clanking the crazy windlass a fairer but not quainter sight is the full-rigged ship coming up the channel it is blowing a brave westerly wind she carries it a little abaft the beam off here and ploughs through it with homesick eagerness there is a yearning in the lifting of every cloth upon her the very skysail the tiny topmast stretch of cloth strains its hardest like a child's distended cheeks with its lips at a penny trumpet as though from its airy seat i had caught sight of the ship's home far up the gleaming river yes this is no idle conceit i have observed again and again a something in the appearance of a ship close to home after a long voyage that denoted a perception of her weary galloping and cantering and walking being nearly over as complete in its way as the sentience expressed by the dog or the horse the hearts and thoughts of her sailors are like a soul in her they make her a living thing yonder ship has the impetuous bearing of a human desire it is idle to pretend that were her head pointed the contrary way and the wind reversed she would discover the same manner of going she floats up swiftly and proudly upon the gaze with excitement in every little hurry of shadow upon her rounded canvas and impatience in the sliding thrust of her cutwater the pilot's flag blows at her peak and the only self-possessed man on board is the pilot himself that little figure marching to and fro from the helm of the break of the poop the tug snorting in chase of her a mile astern helps the suggestion of eagerness 
here is such a picture as was never yet hung upon manorial or castle walls the wet flashing of light from the ship's side the triumphant heralding of her progress by the tremulous pulling of the white pinions upon her jibbooms the snowstorms at her forefoot the gilt veins wherever the glory in the clear sky can find a mirror however dull the delicacy of spar and rigging against the blue the spot of colour aloft the slow darkening of the hollows of her sails as she hauls her wind curious to see our four torpedo boats going through it like sharks in chase the churning of the screws makes a bed of foam in their wake and it is this short length of flying whiteness which one sees before catching sight of the black fire-propelled structures which raise the sputter a small head sea meets them the water flies in blue sheets from their rending stems and they speed gaily through the foam arches of their own building their procession is well ordered an exact distance one from another is kept though travelling at eighteen or twenty miles an hour they pass like a flight of crows at sunset homeward bound their beds of spume shine like stars in the distance when the little fabrics themselves are no longer visible and were you to catch sight of them on a sudden you would imagine them the bases of water-spouts in the act of forming such surprising velocity makes but a poor show of the dull and sullen pace of yonder ugly tank with bow so cocked and funnel and mass so aslant that she looks to be ashore she is flying light and whenever she dips her head two-thirds of her propeller come out of water and amid the hill of froth you spy the black blades of the screw revolving like the arms of a windmill she is so gaunt coarse hideous in shape so minute and abundant in violation of every law that governs taste in shipbuilding that imagination can do nothing with her behold that pole compass forking up to half the height of her funnel follow the elegant camel-backed line of her length observe the dainty taste discoverable in the union of slate colour and red and in a smokestack lozenged in a white ground with yellow and blue of what tricks of trade and convulsions of economic mania is this horrid spectacle the outcome the sunlight streams upon her the glad water heaves under her the horizon along which she passes has many enrichments of vaporous tints but the spirit of beauty withholds its magic there is nothing in all the spells of sea and sky of cloud and atmosphere to brighten with an instant's enchantment that iron ugliness and as if to vex the eye she passes with besotted slowness the good die first this is a north country say hartlepool boat that will warrant three hours to come and go the prettiest things are the fleetest the gazelle is soon out of sight but the crab has a trick of tarrying now comes a foreign ironclad her flag is up and down and indistinguishable how then do we know that she is a foreigner by seeing at once that she is not an english ship the art of furling of tricing up a bunt of squaring to a hair and hauling taut and of making a ship carry her furniture whether in port or at sea just as a blue jacket carries his clothes is not every nationality's i am indeed acquainted with but one country that has it in perfection but modesty will not suffer me to name her yet let me be just there is something shambling in the walk of yonder ironclad and a want of finish of final touches aloft and about her which to a nautical eye is warrant enough that were her flag to blow out it would not reveal the red cross yet i am bound to say that the other day i saw a large english ironclad pass through the gulls under sail and that thus equipped whether because of the dinginess of the canvas or the disproportion between the hull and the masts or the abominable set of the foresail the foot of which hanging over the forestay, as I took it to be, though I could scarcely credit my eyes, gave the whole stretch of canvas something of the look of a tent. She made as ill a figure as could be imagined. Such specimens of unsightliness cannot be helped. You may rig your ironclads to look like ships, but the moment you sheet home and hoist away, the delusion is ended. Erect a funnel upon the simondite, and the travesty would not be more consummate. But the procession viewed from this height goes on and one speedily forgets all about armour-clads here comes a little butter-rig from the west country a galley punt from deal on a hovelling job flashes and vanishes amid the ridged waters a concourse of smacks from the north sea soberly steer for ramsgate a whole flight of schooners pass heading for the downs rotten row is not more diverting in the height of the season and all the while the clear sweet wind whistles gaily past the ear and the line of rocks reverberates the low melodious thunder of the surf after the long golden silence of the summer the echoes of the cliffs will have been rudely awakened by some very tempestuous winds for days and weeks the sea may have stretched like quicksilver reflecting the perfect blue of the english skies in its brilliant and polished surface 
the sands will have sparkled with the sheen of gilt from the sun the cliffs given back the brilliance and visitors panting in the shadows in which the thermometer would have registered a temperature of eighty five degrees will have thought with jealous yearnings of the simple habits of islanders who take their pleasures in garbs as plain as a girdle of leaves but on a sudden the spell is broken hoarse winds are howling dark clouds flying squalls of rain lashing the window glass and the vexed sea making the aspect of its heavy plains wintry with the turbulent flinging of snowstorms of its own foam yet a day full of wind should be welcomed by the seaside visitor people talk of running down to the sea-coast to get a blow and their excursions cannot but prove a disappointment in its way if they find themselves landed in a stagnant atmosphere and in view of a sea as slimy as that upon which the bark of the ancient mariner lay rotting the seaside offers no such suggestion of health as its own strong breezes everything is quickened into delicious vitality by the bright and viewless current of air rushing over the sea full of sounds of laughter and song there are indeed some drawbacks fresh small gales will blow people's hats away take the curl out of feathers and temporarily distort the outline of the human form by a singular arrangement of curves but let the ladies be satisfied to know that their charms are seldom more fascinating than when the artist hands of the wind go to work upon them shake or disarrange the gold or auburn or raven tresses or delicately hint at perfections of figure which fashion only too carefully disguises again a strong wind is obnoxious to the photographer who practices his art on the sands or beach it blows away the screens his comrades hold aloft for the purpose of casting a delicate shadow upon the triple chins of the buxom dame whose grin of expectation at the camera is probably the funniest form of merriment the human countenance is equal to it blows the open umbrella out of the hand and sometimes carries it into the sea it has been known to level aunt sally to capsize the milkman and empty his pails, and to make a balloon of the sweetmeat stall of the old woman who has been reckless enough to protect herself from the heat by attaching a canvas cover to her stand. But, on the other hand, it gives a proud crest to the tall breaker, it makes a kind of living light of the white and moving mass of froth upon the beach, every little gleaming pool amongst the rocks in which children hunt for crabs and shrimps trembles with its own stress of waves, and, as if the sea and coast were not lively enough, there are the clouds on high to keep the whole picture alive with their fleeting shadows one drawback to the windy day at the seaside is its tendency to bring up rain a southwester is notoriously squally but there is very little dependence to be placed upon any other quarter that the wind may choose to blow from if a windy day by the seaside is a delight assuredly a wet day is an intolerable blank inland spas provide against a low barometer by winter gardens sheltered spaces glass halls in which there is generally something going on in the shape of a concert or a band of music but those who direct the affairs of our seaside resorts seem to trouble themselves very little in this direction as a rule when it is wet by the seaside there is nothing to be done except to read the papers and to turn the pages of a novel even if people are fortunate enough to procure lodgings directly facing the sea there is scarcely anything to be seen for the ocean is shrouded with the slate and grey of rain and the view through the weeping glass of the windows is in the last degree dismal and depressing it is even worse still in a back street with nothing but a bay window over the way through which it is possible for the eyesight to penetrate far enough to arrive at the outlines of a family of children fighting and quarrelling seaside municipal authorities should awaken to the perception that it very frequently rains during the summer holidays when their towns are crowded and that it would be a very great convenience to visitors if some resorts were furnished where they could kill the hours in dry clothes and without the need of holding umbrellas over their heads until the clouds broke and the sun or moon shone forth again i cannot dine on hard bake exclaims charles dickens ruefully in one of his sketches it is difficult to pass a holiday in a lodging the pictures are not usually very attractive a man will not commonly find the source of many cheerful reflections in the looking-glass it is possible sometimes to glean a few items of local information from the servant but she is generally in a hurry and her powers of conversation are speedily exhausted however most happily for the seaside visitor the wet day is not the rule the sea breeze is much more constant at some coast towns indeed wind is nearly always blowing and the oldest inhabitants are known to view the dead calm as a species of phenomenon people subject to headaches or persons suffering from short temper would not spend a pleasant holiday in such spots a dull pain in the brow or the obligation to keep the brim of one's hat securely gripped by both hands is not conducive to merry-making then again in towns where it is constantly blowing strong the angles of streets are notoriously sharp 
there are many gusty openings the glazed lamps quiver as though they chattered with their teeth the boatmen are as warmly clad in the dog days as at christmas time and there is always some sort of disaster happening about a mile out of such windy town the sensitive visitor should beware true enjoyment of the seaside is best got out of a variety of weather wet excepted in every mood of nature there is a charm to any one who will take the trouble to unriddle it even the most trying of all the fine weather days the stagnant morning and afternoon when the rocks are so hot that one might almost expect a beefsteak to frizzle upon them when there is not a stir in the atmosphere when the ripples roll like the dying things upon the beach and expire foamless with a sigh when eating is not to be thought of without a kind of loathing and when tobacco smoke is without flavour even in such a loafing lazy perspiring day as this beauties may be witnessed which will hereafter serve to give sweetness and light to the stock of holiday memories which are carried away it is unpardonable indeed if the charm such a day as this holds should escape a man for the heat will allow him to do nothing else but look he will remember afterward the hot distance of the sea sinuously melting into the rusty blue of the sky the old collier still is a painting with patched sails hanging motionless and the sneaking current throwing a dull trembling light into her sides and a dark and trickling vein breaking from the short black cable at its point of contact with the surface the smoke of a distant steamer floating dark as a thundercloud and making a mirage of the heavy hazy remoteness through the dusty blueness of which may be faintly witnessed the sulphur-coloured brows of a body of vapour that has been steadfastly hanging in the same spot for hours but the sea is melancholy without life and it is well when the glaring stillness is broken by the voice of the little gale and when the wide monotony of deep and breathless repose is scattered as by the injunction of a living principle it is the swift joyous roll of the breaker that makes the sea bath delicious it is the movement everywhere that fills and delights the eye ashore the trees wave like signals to the sea windows flash like a discharge of musketry to the alternations of pouring sunshine and veiling cloud the yellow crops roll in billows and a spirit of life may be traced in the most distant hills where the violet shadows and the yellow radiance are sporting seawards boats are flying with the speed of the gulls whose hoarse salt cries are echoed from the head of one sea to another big ships swing in state along their course and shine like moons as they float along the blue of the horizon in the enclosed waters there is a perpetual fountain-like music of ripples upon which the wherries splash and tumble nothing is still every flag blows merrily the wind catches up the sound of human voices and laughter and makes their echoes multitudinous by the broadcasting of its vast wings a strong breeze at the seaside may have its inconveniences but it is the one condition of the coast which visitors who desire health and delight for the eye will wish for but perhaps the finest seaside effects are to be witnessed in winter after a long and heavy fall of snow on the sea-coast snow is only a little less lovely in its effects than moonshine it does not quite equal the bland luminary's power of at once chastening and enriching but it has a quality of surprising the eye with beauties above the magic of the orb's most sparkling beam a heavy fall will transfer leagues and leagues of the seaboard into sheer wonderland the line of coast runs shining into airy blue distances as crystalline in aspect as the pairing of the new moon hanging high in the midday heavens one might indeed suppose that old winter had changed these islands into a vast territory of ice to judge from the sheen floating in a misty sort of radiance into the atmosphere from the tracts of sloping dazzle and the fancy is completed by the glaring ramparts of chalk falling in stark abruptness from the luminous softness of their summits to the yeast of the breaker boiling at their base there are some parts of the coast which a man might well have need to look at twice before venturing to give a name to them inland there will be scarce a snow picture that is not of dainty grace and tender elegance the trees droop under their burden of white blossoms the meanest little hovel grows in a night into a fairy fabric an aspect of pensive romance comes upon the land with the noiseless floating falls of the glistening feathers but as the coast is approached the sentiment of the picture takes a certain note of wildness and manifold as is the beauty of the scene the inland spirit of gentleness has vanished there is indeed no finer picture imaginable than that of a line of snow-clad cliff washed by the dark green of the winter sea with brows and peaks showing ghastly as the light of foam on a moonless night against the dingy sky beyond its perfections offer best to the distant eye 
the familiar steals out of the approach but from afar even the well-known points might pass for atmospheric fantasies it is only fit perspective for the wintry scene of sullen waters and dark clouds blowing into whiteness as they discharge their storm of snow upon the bleak northeasterly blast the sand stretch brown and hard to the curl of the olive-coloured surge the salt of them melts the snow quickly and what that leaves unfinished the crawling of the tide or the headlong flash of the breaker completes the wheel of the sun is so low on the horizon that it looks as if it would run foul of the tall mastheads of the great ship yonder which is rolling along her homeward course over the short bounds of the sea with the whole weight of the german ocean in every fling it is difficult at such a time to conceive that summer will ever visit these cold white silent dominions again the memory of children sporting in the silver of the warm surf with the high sun showering a golden sparkling upon the soft yellow sand is as a recurrence to another form of life altogether as one stands upon the shore following the cold bald streaks of the snow-covered cliffs to where they vanish in pearly blobs and misty films upon the sharp grey line of the restless waters and listening to the harsh cry of a gull sailing low directly overhead and to the multitudinous hissing of the sea racing in an endless procession of breakers bursting with blasts of noise against the resonant cliffs or darting aloft in pillars of froth from the sides of the half-tide rocks there is nothing in sunlight or in moonshine to qualify in the picture of a winter coast the element of wildness that forms at once its spirit and its beauty there is no feature or incident of it that does not serve to accentuate this quality from the late hour of the pink flushing of the east to the early hour of the stormy crimsoning of the west and on yet through the night whether black with the shadow of flying clouds or serene and radiant to the icy shining of the planet there are scores of things to gaze upon to find delight in and many to marvel at indeed there is nothing in the summer scene to compare with the winter show of our english seaboard there is peace in the blue heavens and azure complexion of the hot holiday months but none now the ocean may rest as motionless as a sheet of glass without a heave of swell or stir of ripple to distort for a breath the flakes of starlight that float upon her breast in tiny shafts of silver there may not be a sound to break the air save the indescribable complaining noise which steals upon the ear vague as a half-remembered fancy from the sliding creep of the unfurrowed tide upon the beach nothing may be stirring unless it be the black outline of some little craft stemming to the impulse of her oars down the white path of moonlight upon the water and slightly swaying as she comes as though she were a fan noiselessly vibrated by some hand hidden beneath the surface every element of peace seems to be in such a scene as this yet somehow the true spirit of repose is wanting the mind is troubled by a sense of conflict the hush along the white spectral line of coast is scarcely less defiant than would be the noise of the thunder of breakers spurned by its iron foot the rarity of the still moonlight night upon the sea coasts in winter makes one think of the placid picture as a touch above nature it is beautiful but its wildness is preternatural beyond the inspiration of the fierce gale and the sight of the small green moon flying like a silver cannon-ball from the edge of one dark flying shadow to another old winter has a knack of breathing hard even when he slumbers and one is commonly right in suspecting a malicious device when he hides his hoary beard and holds his icy breath and postures to the eye though not in the flesh as a summer month it is well to steal a glance at the barometer at such a time we shall hear him groaning in the chimney anon. It will not be long before his sharp talons are making a drum of every window casement in the house. His roars of laughter will be heard running in thunderous echoes along the silent ranges, which, throughout the period of his stillness, have been standing silent, watchful, and ever defiant of his approach. In truth, old winter makes but an ill mummer. He may rend his garment of cloud and cast it aside, set the moon as a jewel in the middle of his forehead, adorn his bald pate with stars and close his formidable figure with the beauty of a still clear night but in spite of his waggery we shall know him as falstaff was known by his beard and after a pleasant survey of his ingenious make-up turn our backs upon him without the least doubt that in a very short time he will have flung his summer trappings away and be making the cold white cliffs ring again with his terrible mirth if however winter be treacherous he is also very lavish his panoramas are spacious and many of them magnificent he will often indeed shroud the ocean and the coast in fog and in flying snow for days 
but again and again the curtain is lifted with such prodigality of presentment behind that the mind will sometimes be bewildered by the splendid profusion there will be a dozen different effects of sky scenery in an hour the rolling cloud surcharged with his own weight bending its ashen burden to the very crests of the leaping billows a slow passage of storm of snow looking to boil and whirl like volumes of steam as it blows past and eclipses the wet and slanting beam of pale sunshine that has darted lance-like through some green drift among the moving bodies of vapour the weeping shadow over the land glides onwards with the perpetual emergence of the flashing snow streak from its trailing skirts until the whole bright line lies exposed the whiter as it would seem for the cleansing fingers of mist which have passed along it the winter's breath sharpens and clarifies colour and outline there are days in high gales often when the atmosphere is so brilliantly clear that the lenses of the telescope scarcely assist the naked eye in defining the tints and shapes of distant objects a sharper glare appears in the break of the foam and in the scattering of spray than is ever to be seen in summer thousands know the sea-coast only when the sun stands high and when the roses are in bloom and the hedgerows leafy to such as these the spectacle of the winter coast would furnish a memory well worth preserving the delight might not indeed linger life would undoubtedly bore them for a little but the novelty of the scene would repay the trouble of taking a glimpse of it indeed by most it would be thought the fairer and the more engaging for lacking almost every element which entices people to the coast in summer time the donkey is at rest the voice of the showman is hushed the bathing machine stands high and dry nothing seems to survive the entertainments of the summer but the bath chair on the other hand the breakers are bursting upon the beach with voices they are never known to utter at any other time of year the white ramparts of the seaboard look grandly down upon the darkening green ocean that rolls at their feet the snow beautifies the land but even to the humblest scenery of the coast it will give an aspect that falls little short of grandeur End of section 16. Recording by Dan Freeze.